Anthropologically speaking, human prehistory is divided up into certain segments, some minor and some major, but none more important than the division between the Pleistocene, which includes the time most popularly known as the Ice Age, and the Holocene, which is our current age for the past 10 to 12,000 years or so, a time following some major global cataclysms, upheavals, and mass extinctions. That said, we can further dissect the current Holocene into the Neolithic, or Stone Age, when agriculture appears, or possibly reappears, when the tools and weapons archaeologists find are made from polished stone, starting around 11 to 12,000 years ago. This period is followed by the Copper Age, at around 3500 BC to 2500 BC an era of transition between the stone tool using farmers of the Neolithic and the metal obsessed civilizations of the Bronze Age. Copper is relatively easy to heat and work into various shapes and far superior to stone in terms of agricultural use or to make weapons with. The first use of metal was not seen equally around the world, regardless of what some of the current Marxist or globalist propaganda might be on the subject, but instead spread out from Anatolia to areas around the Mediterranean, as did the domesticated animals used in large-scale agriculture, the kind required to establish state societies, feed armies, build pyramids, and disseminate the set of languages which prior to World War II were called Aryan languages. The reason we, meaning anthropologists, use the word Aryan is because the word Aryan is etched in stone thousands of years ago by the earliest agricultural civilization's nobility that called themselves, and their language, Aryan. There is no example anywhere in ancient history where the term Proto-Indo-European is used until after World War II when it replaced the word Aryan for political reasons, which is a polite way of saying to hide true history and to replace it with egalitarian, cult-like fairy tales, such as the now genetically debunked out of Africa hypothesis. Please let me repeat, according to data derived from extensive genetic sequencing, Sub-Saharan Africans did not leave Africa, mutate into East Asians 50,000 years ago, and then again mutate into Caucasians or Europeans to populate Europe 35,000 years ago. This is archaeologically, mythologically, and now genetically debunked as the earliest Europeans, or Cro-Magnon types, have had their genome sequenced and have been found to be genetically identical to certain modern European populations. So when exactly did all this supposed evolution take place? It didn't. The human races are a result of a hybridization of Cro-Magnon and the various different hominin species, not by mutation, adaptation, or the pseudo-religious philosophy pushed by the United Nations known as evolution. Which brings us to the topic of today's episode regarding the Bronze Age. These Aryans, the people who were the nobility of the agricultural civilizations of the Middle East, the nobility of the upper caste systems of India, the nobility of the earliest Chinese civilizations, the ones that left those Chinese pyramids and six foot six inch tall blonde mummies millennia before the first East Asians arrived, like the nobility of North Africa, where again we find pyramids and blonde and red-headed mummies called pharaohs or god kings. You'll notice that I stress the word nobility because until modern times, socialism and communism did not exist. And there were only one demographic that diffused agricultural civilization, domesticated animals, and metals around. Archaeological digs have shown that the ancient town was inhabited by the forebears of the Aryan race. Those ancient Aryans were credited with everything on earth. They were even said to have discovered metals. By the forebears of the Aryan race. 
Those ancient Aryans were credited with everything on Earth. They were even said to have discovered metals. Now, before we get into the Bronze Age, let's first clear up some lovely myths, starting with the, quote, New World. America was not named after the Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci, but instead, the name of the American continent was adopted from its original inhabitants, such as the early inhabitants of Peru that called it Amaruca, meaning land of the plumed serpents, which incidentally is also the chief deity of the Maya in Central America, Cucucan, which means plumed or feathered serpent, as does Quetzalcoatl of the Aztec in Mexico. In fact, the Incan leader that was captured and executed by the Spanish in 1572 was named Tupac Amaru, which means Shining Serpent. It's no coincidence that in this statue of Amerigo Vespucci, there's a reptile beneath his feet, climbing a column representing America, as serpent worship was a worldwide phenomenon before history became so distorted. That said, a more correct translation or interpretation of plumed or feathered serpent is winged serpent. And this symbol can still be seen in museums in Egypt and the Middle East, with flying dragons also prevalent in ancient Asia. Officially, America is named after the explorer Amerigo Vespucci, but this appears doubtful, like so much of American history, which has transformed a one-time pirate of the family name Griego into an iconic hero named Christopher Columbus. As for America, according to Manley Hall, America is named after the Plumed Serpent, who is the messenger of the sun. He was the god Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, and in Peru he was called Amaru. From the latter name comes our word America. Amaruca is, literally translated, Land of the Plumed Serpent. While 1492 is probably most famous as the year given for when Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, it was also a time of great change in Europe, where Jews were facing a choice of mass conversion, expulsion, or worse, a time historically known as the Spanish Inquisition. It seems much of the history we were given about Columbus and the peopling of the Americas is false. How many people really realize what happened within the Jewish community in mm. Spain in 1492? Now, recently we've discovered that Christopher Columbus, Cristobal Colon, was known as a quote-unquote Marrano. Mm. Marrano? Mm -hmm. The Marranos are those that were forced to convert to Roman Catholicism that were Sephardim, and then they were forced to eat pork, uh, which is very unkosher, and then they were called marrano, pigs, mm -hmm. swine. Because you see the, the facade of the Spanish Inquisition. What is Inquisition? It comes from the root word to inquire. Mm -hmm. But this was more than inquiring. This was uh, spying and forcing Jews to convert to Roman Catholicism. So King Solomon would send, along with King Hiram of the Phoenician Empire, fleets of ships every three years to Tarshish to bring back gold and silver, exotic animals, exotic fruits, and so forth. This ancient Tarshish is none other than Sepharad. You must say, what's Sepharad? Sepharad is Spain. Even to this date, Spain is Sepharad. And from there you derive the term Sephardic or Sephardim that are the initial ancestors of Jews in Spain, that's Sephardat. Now, talking about Christopher Columbus, a lot of people don't know, but I'm sharing this with you, he was a converso, meaning he too was a crypto Jew or a Jew in hiding. It so happens that the majority of the passengers on La Niña, La Pinta, La Santa Maria, his fleet of ships, were of our kind of surname. What kind of surname? Hispanic surname, Spanish surnames. We are the descendants, many of you are descendants of the secret Jews of Spain. That's the crypto Jews I'm referring to. We are incorrectly taught that Christopher Columbus got lost on his way to search for spices from India. 
And so when he landed on the shores of the Americas, mistakenly called the inhabitants Indians. The term Indian is no longer politically correct, and neither is the term Redskins. The reason, again, is the high true history. As Christopher Columbus departed on his voyage in 1492, the night before a new law went into effect expelling Jews from Europe. As I've stated in a previous video on Columbus's true identity, and he correctly called the Eastern natives Indian, as they were swastika adorned Aryans from India that fled after a major war, as recorded in ancient Indian texts, who like the ancient Egyptians and Minoans, rubbed red ochre on their white skin, resulting in the term redskins. No genetic testing or examination can be made on any ancient native mummies, and not even a photograph is allowed on any native remains discovered, as anthropologists, such as myself, can determine race based on one glance of a skull, and we don't need DNA. That said, the oldest remains of the New World, from the Florida bog mummies, to the Newfoundland mummies, to the Spirit Cave mummies, and others all shared genetic affinities with the ancient Europeans, such as remains found in ancient Basque graves or ancient North African Caucasians, such as the original Berbers. As ancient Aryans discovered that mixing some tin with copper made the metal much stronger, the Bronze Age was born. Bronze being harder and more durable than copper or other metals available at the time this technological advantage allowed for a great deal of conquest. One example is the Hyksos pharaohs, who rode into Africa with their superior metal weapons, introducing bronze to the continent, as well as a horse and chariot. The word Hyksos translates to foreign rulers, or rulers of foreign lands, and this group of Caucasians searched far and wide for places to mine both tin and copper. While Cornwall, England is well known for its ancient tin mines, archaeologists have had a harder time locating the ancient sources of copper that fueled the Bronze Age. While copper itself is named after the island of Cyprus, as the Greek word Kyprios and the Latin word Cuprum refer to the ancient copper mines on the island, there simply was not enough to account for the quantity produced in ancient times and it was of a low-grade ore. That said, there are a number of places in the world where copper can be found in small deposits in the pure state, but it is usually embedded in a rock matrix from which it must be freed by intensive labor. There is one place, however, that did have abundant ancient copper mining and of the purest quality. Most European copper was smelted out of copper ores starting at about 4460 BC. These ores often had a concentration of 15% copper in them, and many had trace elements of contaminants such as lead. On the other hand, it is estimated that a half billion pounds of copper were mined in tens of thousands of pits in Michigan by ancient miners over a period of a thousand years, starting at around 2450 BC and ending abruptly at around 1200 BC. Officially, no one knows where the Michigan copper went, and at the same time, no one seems to know where all that copper in Europe suddenly came from. Indian, or if you prefer Native American legends, tell of the mining that was done by fair-haired marine men. Here's an image of one of their sailing ships. I found it interesting that 10 tons of copper oxide ingots, or melted bars, were recovered from a late Bronze Age shipwreck off the coast of Turkey around 1300 BC, and was found to be extraordinarily pure, more than 99.5% pure, and that it was not the product of smelting from ore. Only Michigan copper is of this purity, and was mined in such large quantity. Could there have been a transatlantic trade in ancient times? And if so, who could have done it? This is an ancient portrayal of a Phoenician ship. 
which looks remarkably similar to the ancient petroglyph linked to the Native American red skin legends. By the way, Phoenician comes from the Greek word phoinos, meaning red. Pippi Longstocking is a red-haired, freckled, nine-year-old girl who, like Peter Pan, does not want to grow up. She's the daughter of a buccaneer captain, and her best friends are a horse, a monkey, and the two children living next door in a small Swedish village where she lives. Pippi is the daughter of a South Seas seafarer, Ephraim Longstocking, captain of a sailing ship who bought Pippi her house to give his daughter a more stable home life than that on board the ship. Her father was believed lost at sea, but Pippi insisted that her father was still alive, had rescued himself to an island, and had been made king of the natives. She believed her father would one day come to look for her. As it turned out, Captain Longstocking had been washed ashore upon a South Sea island where he was made the quote, fat white chief by its native people. Her dad did eventually return to Sweden to bring Pippi to his new home in the South Seas, but Pippi found herself attached to her new friends, Tommy and Annika, and decided to stay where she was in Sweden, but only after she was confirmed as the, quote, fat white chief's daughter, Princess Pippi Lota. Pippi's father was a buccaneer, a kind of privateer or free sailor, peculiar to the Caribbean Sea during the 17th and 18th centuries. Originally, the term applied to seafaring hunters where meat was caught and smoked to make jerky and they sold that to what were essentially pirates. Most, if not all, of these transatlantic pirates were Jews, or Moranos, which were crypto-Jews who were forced to convert and or were expelled from Spain and other parts of Europe in 1492. To understand how these Jews got into Europe in the first place, one needs to take a closer look at ancient Egypt, specifically the 15th and 16th dynasty, known as the Hyksos, which means rulers of foreign countries, who were Asiatics, according to Manetho, and were driven out around 1500 BC. The same way that the original U.S. colonies were divided into 13, the people known as Israelites divided themselves up into tribes, the most famous being the tribe of Judah, from where we get the term Jew from. That said, after Cyrus the Great attacked Babylon and freed the Jewish captives, allowing them to return to Palestine, or modern Israel, many of the other tribes also took the name of Jew, even though they were from other tribes, such as the tribe of Dan. At the time of the Exodus, some of the Danites, according to the Jewish Encyclopedia, decided to stay in their ships and started to name places that they colonized with the word Dan, such as Sardania. They were feared as pirates, even then, distinguished by their horned helmets, round shields, and large swords. At the time of about Moses, when he led the children out of Israel with the kingdom of Egypt left in shambles, some chose not to follow Moses into the land of Canaan. About 1500 BC, a last flowering of megalithic culture occurred on the island of Sardinia in the Mediterranean Sea a tower building people sometimes called Chardana emerged and soon dominated Sardinia and then invaded Corsica and the Balearics and ruled them for about a thousand years these were the ancient Danites their very name identifies them they gave their name to their island Sardinia and the very name Shardana proves who they really were. I looked at the naming of the actual monarch butterfly and this is Wikipedia. This butterfly is named after Danos. Now who is Danos? Well I will show you. Danos is from the tribe of Dan. It states out here 
in this historic book. It says Danos, of the tribe of Dan, landed at the city of Argos and gained control of it. Now who was Dan in the Bible? Dan, it says here, was the fifth son of Jacob with Bilah. He was Bilah's first son, the founder of the Israelite tribe of Dan. In the biblical account, Dan's mother is described as Rachel's handmaid. And I want you to look, of course, at the as above, so below symbology here, with the two inverted pyramids. And of course, this is the Star of David. But inside this mark, you also see the serpent. I found some a very interesting article here about the tribe of Dan and the serpent seed. And it says here, the tribe of Dan is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They are named after their ancestor Dan, who was one of the sons of Jacob of Israel. Dan means to judge, govern, or rule. The tribe of Dan, one of their main symbols because they were seen as judges. They have the serpent. And they also have the scales. Many hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, about the time of the greatness of Solomon, king of Israel, who reigned from 1015 to 975 BC, the power, the wealth, and the influence of Phoenicia as a maritime nation was immense, and had been so throughout prior centuries. From their command of the sea, the Phoenicians, stemming from among the Israelites, became the greatest seafarers of the ancient world. From Tyre and Sidon they spread westward to colonize and to trade. On the map the colonies are shaded green, mainly North Africa and southern Spain, and the trade routes are marked by red dots, hugging the North African coast and the western seaboard of Spain. The commerce of Tyre reached throughout the world. Merchants sailed the high seas far and wide and built a vast empire. This drawing is of a relief found in the palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh, depicting a Phoenician fleet of warships protecting merchant ships in 714 BC. Long-range, deep-sea-going craft like this would be at sea for 12 months or more about the year 600 BC. They circumnavigated Africa and adventured where none had ever gone before. From the earliest times, the ships of Israel sailed with the ships of Tyre, with the result that all, regardless of nationality, even the Greeks, became known as Phoenicians. These were people by no means as mysterious as they have been regarded. Indeed, they may well be placed among the great builders of our world. Today, following in the footsteps of other historicists, there are many who uphold and testify to the contention that a vast trade relationship existed between Phoenicia and Cornwall. Diodorus Siculus, who lived in the time of Augustus, BC 20, described it at length and in detail. Here, in part, is how he marked out the very sea and land routes that the Phoenicians followed. He writes, This tin metal is transported into Gaul, the merchants carrying it on horseback through the heart of Celtica to Marseille and Narbo. Posidonius, who also travelled to Britain about 80 BC, also wrote about the tin mines of Dumnonia, which is Devon, and Balerium, which is Cornwall. So now our story brings us to the shores of Balerium, the Cornish Peninsula, where the Hebrew merchants bartered on the beaches for the crudely smelted ingots. Today, the county is profusely studded with the gaunt granite engine houses, the crumbling brick stacks and the ruined calciners, the overgrown ruins of a hundred years or more, the remains and debris of an industry having its roots in biblical antiquity. The fact that tin was sought after literally thousands of years ago is supported by the certainty that Cornwall, being so richly endowed in the mineral, became longest and more intensively mined than any other in Britain, in fact than in most of Europe. These roughly shaped blocks of tin were discovered in 1974 at Pra Sands, less than 20 miles from Land's End. There seems no doubt that they are from the same period. Are we not now entitled to consider these early Britons in the light of what Camden tells us in the first volume of his Britannia, published in 1806, concerning the Israelitish tribe of Asher, which stemmed from the eighth son of Jacob. He comes out boldly with the statement, and I quote, The merchants of Asher worked the tin mines, not as slaves, but as masters and exporters. Unquote. The aspect of the Celt is terrifying. They are very tall in stature, with rippling muscles under clear white skin. 
Their hair is blonde and thick and shaggy like a horse's mane. They wear brightly colored and embroidered shirts with striped and checkered cloaks fastened at the shoulders with a golden brooch. We are told that the Hyksos were a people of mixed Semitic and Asian descent who invaded Egypt and settled in the Nile Delta around 1640 BC. They formed the 15th and 16th dynasties of Egypt and ruled a large part of the country until driven out. Anthropologically speaking, Semitic better describes a linguistic group uh, than it does a race. And as far as Asian descent, an article published recently reveals the genetic identity of a blue-eyed people that occupied what is now modern Israel over 6,000 years ago, coming from Iran and Western Asia, where we also find massive pyramids orientated identically to the ones found in Egypt, with 4,000-year-old Aryan mummies genetically related to Egypt's blonde and red-headed pharaohs and nobility. Well, there's that research we're, uh, that we're hearing today that, that shows half of all Western European men are somehow related to the Egyptian pharaoh, King Tutankhamun. Uh, see if he's uh, Morella Fernandez here with more on this. Morella, uh, what's up with this? It's really interesting, actually. Yeah. So this is coming out of Switzerland, and the researchers there have found that not only do half of Western European men have this connection, genetic profile connection, but 70% of men in Britain, which is astounding, but yeah. they all have the same uh, genetic profile or same ancestry as King Tut from Egypt way back when. Here's what's really shocking about this less than one percent of modern day egyptians have that same connection isn't that interesting we are here at the state historical center and we're going to show you a few things here in the museum almost a two-ton nugget of float copper pushed up by glacial ice look at the patina on that this thing is gorgeous, but this is a huge nugget of copper. They may have some, and then people's hands and everything touching it over the years, I'm sure has polished it a bunch too. That is just sick, man. And here we have a bit more of Michigan metals. That ore right there contains a little bit of gold and silver, and that may be a silver nugget right there. And then we have some nice copper nuggets. Big, thick one right there in the back. That one looks like a horn, almost. It's like quartz crystal. And I'm not sure about that one. It looks like a little bowl or a cup, almost. It's pretty unique. All part of Michigan history in copper. Phoenicians would mix the tin from places around the UK with copper from places as far away as Michigan to create bronze, a superior metal which the Hicksaw pharaohs introduced to Egypt, as well as the horse and chariot and other domesticated animals. These Aryans are credited with agriculture spreading out from Anatolia during the Holocene, the period we are now in following the Ice Age, and they also domesticated many animals which made agricultural civilization possible, like the oxen and horses, and introduced those animals to places like Egypt and Africa as well, not to mention India, but that will be another video. An interesting biological genetic note about these people is that they're the only demographic in the world, these Caucasians, that are not lactose intolerant as an adult. By default, most mammals and humans enjoy their mother's milk as an infant, but as an adult cannot properly digest the lactose. But these people, after millennia of raising cows and drinking milk, can drink milk as an adult with no problem. And the people of Northern Europe are also of this genetic profile and are rarely lactose intolerant. Another link indicating a connection between the people of the Mediterranean and the people of Northern Europe.
archaeologists have found evidence that disproves the idea that the Clovis people were the first to spread across the Americas via a corridor between the ice sheets of modern Canada. For a better part of the last century, it was taught in all federally funded universities that humans made it from Siberia to Alaska via the Bering Land Bridge before moving down the corridor and populating the rest of North and South America, totally ignoring archaeological evidence in South America, which date back over 30,000 years. So now the obsolete Clovis first theory is finally put to rest. Clovis refers to a type of stone tool technology, a very specific type of bifacial uh, spear tip used for hunting, attributed to a wave of settlers to the New World at the end of the Pleistocene, or Ice Age. In my books, I link up this Clovis spear tool technology to what is called Solutrian technology in Western Europe. This concept is still considered radical in American anthropology and very controversial anywhere where the United Nations has any influence on academia. It implies a Eurocentric perspective on the peopling of the Americas, at least in part. And despite this unpopular concept, a remarkable series of several dozen Solutrian style stone tools dating back between 19,000 and 26,000 years have been discovered at six different locations along the United States East Coast. You can learn more about these finds by following the work of Professor Dennis Stanford of the Smithsonian Institution. Another fascinating Native American artifact that I document is this green slate stone swastika and if you look closely, you can see that they are snakes or serpents. This symbol was outlawed in 1940 with Native American tribes abandoning it for political reasons. And it seems odd that it is still forbidden 70 years later, especially when it was held in such high esteem by so many Native American tribes. Enough so to not only be posted on Arizona highway signs before World War II, but the swastikas appear on Clovis spear tips if you look close. So what's the danger here? Are we at risk of a Native American uprising and takeover? Or is this ancient peaceful symbol with global distribution since the Ice Age getting a bad rap by the seemingly academically corrupt winners of World War II, and if so, what aspect of prehistory are they trying to hide? Could it be that the ancient myths, legends, and religions are correct when they speak of a long-lost global empire which existed prior to meeting its demise by global cataclysms or a deluge? While one might be able to piece together remnants of this forgotten or hidden global seafaring civilization through archaeological symbols, such as the widely distributed swastika, one might also turn to the symbolism attributed to the color red, which, as I have said before, is the meaning of the word Phoenician, but also behind words like Russia, where Rus means red which speaks to the Rus or swastika-adorned Norse Viking tribe from Sweden, which merged with and assimilated with Slavic, Baltic, and Finnic tribes, which makes up modern Russia, or the Red Paint people, also known as the Maritime Archaic, who made transatlantic voyages over 7,000 years ago, or the Minoan, Early Egyptian, Mycenaean, Etruscan, and other Mediterranean people that many associate with the tribe of Dan, who incidentally are associated with the color red. The term Dan can be found all over Europe, from the Danube River to Denmark, which some historians claim 
get their name from lost Israelite tribes, which most mainstream historians discount, but occult organizations and secret societies embrace and guard, which may explain why a certain banking dynasty, covertly associated with the Templars, that changed their Germanic name from Bauer to Rothschild, meaning red shield in English, the same color of a certain flags of nations who trace their origins to Atlantis, the mythical land that Edgar Cayce claimed was inhabited by a race of people that was associated with red, which, if true, likely was inhabited by Cro-Magnon man, the first hominin anthropologists consider a modern human who also covered their burials and skin with iron oxide and red ochre. That said, I'd like to reiterate some information that I covered in a previous video about the Templar Society, a German Protestant sect with roots in the Pietist movement of the Lutheran Church. They spell Templar differently than the Knights Templar, but their beliefs also revolve around rebuilding the Temple in Jerusalem, the land reclaimed by the Knights Templar during the Crusades, the part of the Levant once considered part of the Phoenician Empire, and where the Egyptian historian Manetho claimed that the Hyksos pharaohs settled by those that the Bible calls Israelites. I'll also leave a link to that video in the description for those interested in following this line of research. There's a lot more I can say about this subject, but it'll have to wait. For now, I'd like to point out some interesting facts about President Trump whose paternal ancestry is traceable to Bohemian Amberg, a village in southwestern Germany in the 18th century. Its residents are known as Palatines. Their historic coat of arm is the Palatine Lion, with its tongue extended, a red crown, symbols of their ruling families as seals, and also on the Bavarian coat of arms. Bavaria's origins date back to Celts and Subian groups. The Celts identify as one of the lost tribes that entered Europe, and the Subians should sound familiar to my readers as in Swabia, or Neuschwabenland, the area of Antarctica annexed by the nationalist Germans and central to Operation High Jump, the classified post-World War II military invasion of Antarctica by Allied forces. Johann Trump, born in Bobenheim in 1789, moved to the nearby village of Kalstadt, where his grandson, Frederick Trump, the grandfather of Donald Trump, was born in 1869. This German heritage was long concealed by Donald Trump's father, Fred Trump, after World War II and until the 1980s. He told people he was of Swedish ancestry. Donald Trump repeated this version in The Art of the Deal, published in 1987, but later said he was proud of his German heritage. Of course, Sweden was founded by the same group of people that we call Swabians, and very few people understand what that means. That said, one needs only look at the occult, meaning hidden, symbology of the Trump Tower to gain a deeper insight into his true ancestry. Completed in 1983, it has an official height of 664 feet, but if you count its spire, however, it raises its height to 666 feet. While 666 is called the number of the beast in most manuscripts of Revelation, a fragment of the earliest papyrus gives the number of 616 as the original number of the beast. In a Kabbalistic context, 666 is a positive holy number associated with light or the sun and the heart chakra. 666 is also the number of the goddess such as Ishtar, Isis, Aphrodite and is sacred in Egyptian mythology. It's related to sex, fertility and motherhood. That said, Trump Tower also features an inverted triangle made up of trees or bushes. An upside down triangle is also a symbol of the goddess. In alchemy, it means water or the divine feminine energy. And if you look closely, you'll see that the trees are arranged in three rows of six, making up the three sides of the triangle. 
I'd like to also point out that the tree itself is a sacred sex symbol from the tree in the Garden of Eden to the fig or Bodhi tree associated with Buddha and enlightenment, which is really a reference to Tantra. Above this inverted triangle of trees, we see seven pillars rising. If you count the points at the top of the building, you'll notice there are seven, which in Tantra are the number of chakras in the human body. In astral theology, there are seven gods, meaning the five visible planets with the naked eye, plus the sun and the moon. In Islam, or Sufi cosmology, there are seven heavens and hells. And, of course, in the biblical context, it's the seven days of creation. In a more esoteric perspective, seven has to do with sacred geometry. As Pythagoras tells us, the number seven is, quote, the essence or first principle of things. That said, Donald Trump is of RH negative blood type. You know, I'm proud to have that German blood. There's no question about it. Great stuff. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.